Okay. Um, so, Minneapolis and St. Paul are actually some of my favorite cities because, as you said, this is, this is what our future looks like. And I know that there's an impression about Minnesota, but my time in Minnesota, this is what it looks like. And these are the stories that I want to tell. So thank all of you for being here, for being present, and for showing who and what our future looks like. You know, there's this man, he, he is actually an anti-immigration activist. His name is Mark Rikorian, and he said, yeah, yeah, the United States, we used to be a country that liked immigrants because that was when we were in our adolescent phase. But now the United States has grown up and we've passed that adolescent phase. So we don't need any, any immigrants and that's not what's gonna make us strong. But I look out at you and I'm like, Mark Rikorian, you are so wrong because this is who we are. This is the cradle of America and you in this part of the country have kept it alive. And what I love about the people from this area is that you are doers. You don't sit back and complain. You act, you engage. And the great thing about Minneapolis is that it's small enough where you can actually affect change. So congratulations to all of you for showing up. And that was some serious drumming out there. I love that. Um, OK, so for Latinos, this is a particularly challenging time. La verdad, la verdad, we're confused. We're very confused. I have a name for this. I call it the US Mambo. Three steps forward, two steps back. <laughs> because you see, they love us and they hate us. And I am gonna spend much of my time talking about Latinos and Latino issues because frankly, even though we're very present here, across the country we still feel invisible. It's that mixed message. So Latinos are a trillion dollar market in the United States of America. Huge, but at the same time, we're deporting more Latinos than ever in history. Corporations will attempt to sell us their products, but there's also a commitment to making Latinos and immigrants feel fear at every point in their lives. Latinos are the most coveted for purchasing and for moving into the consumer market. I just interviewed Cecile Richards, the president of Planned Parenthood, who said Latinas will lead and set the tone for the national conversation about reproductive rights. Sofia Vergara is the top paid actress on television in Hollywood. Latinas represent, just launched a, a new initiative to get more Latinas in office. At the same time, mis queridos, we have the highest rate for Latina teens of attempted suicide in our country. We are filled with self-doubt and self-hate, and there is rampant depression. Latino kids are taking the ACTs, that particular test. The, the, the percentage of Latino kids taking that test has shot up 90% over the last eight years. Huge Latinos moving into higher education with dreams. But at the same time, Books written by Latino authors are banned in a state like Arizona. It's been rescinded. But books banned in the year 2013, 2012, in our United States of America, that's what resistance to change looks like. Because also, not only do you have banned books, in a state like Arizona, you also have a reality where in the state of Georgia, if you are undocumented, it is illegal for you to go to college. You will not be educated. It will break a law if you go to get educated. This is the message that's being sent to us. The flip side of that is that we, all of us together, are engaged in our democracy and we are creating and we're engaging and we're letting thoughts fire off in our heads and so we create things. So, in order to combat books being banned in Arizona, there's a movement called the Libro Traficante movement. So not the narco traficante, not the drug smugglers, 
They're libro traficantes. They're book smugglers, and they're smuggling books into Arizona so that people can read them. Exactly. And what's happening in Georgia is that, yes, in the year 2014, you have underground classrooms for college students. We know about the Underground Railroad, and now underground classro classrooms for our students. So pressure against us and the response, active, engaged, dreaming of what's possible in our United States of America. We see America the Beautiful being sung in Spanish, sponsored by Coke. But at the same time, I go home and I hear the story of a friend of mine, Silvia, whose brother-in-law was picked up in a park for carrying an open can of beer in a paper bag. Okay, it's against the law. But he was put into jail, had to serve time, and after he completed his sentence, then was immediately put into a detention center, and Silvia says to me, Señora Maria, no sé dónde está. I don't know where he is. And because I'm undocumented, I won't go look for him. And no one has told us where he is. We have people in the United States of America who are disappeared, who we can't find. People who are saying, I don't even know where I am or why I'm here. This is our United States of America. That due process is violated for one person without a paper, a legal paper right to be here. That due process violated for that person is due process violated for all of us. And we must speak up. We know that there is a school to prison pipeline. Well, gee, I don't know. If you go to a city like Syracuse, New York, where I was just a couple of years ago, I was invited to a similar situation like this, and someone just kind of revealed to me, they said, yes, do you know that the Latino dropout rate in Syracuse is 65%? Oh, you may. So I'm sorry, so the dropout rate was at 50%, and they were like, well, yeah, you know, it's at 50%. And then it went up to 55%, ah, well, you know, it went up to 55%, oh, well. Then it went up to 60%, and people, in positions of power are just like, well, 65% dropout rate? There's not a problem with our students, mis queridos. There's a problem with the institution. In response, we have English language learning classes. We have schools that are popping up. And so I want to tell you a story of a place very far from here. It's Siler City, North Carolina, where 10 years ago they tried to establish one person said, oh my God, we don't have any bilingual ed classes, and I don't speak Spanish, but I know that we can't have children who's, who are in this school who can't speak English and we can't communicate with them because if there's something dangerous that happens, how are we gonna talk to them? So she single-handedly went to Mexico, learned how to speak Spanish, came back, created English language learner classes, and it was a huge controversy, and people started pulling out of the kinder kindergarten classes. They had the biggest, outward flow of students when they found out, and these were mostly white parents, when they found out that they were gonna be teaching dual language in the classrooms in Siler City. 10 years later, every single kindergarten class in Siler City Elementary School in North Carolina is a dual language class. And guess what? Oh, there's a lot of change in registration because people are trying to get into the classes now because they want all of their kids to be bilingual. That is how you change the narrative. Same thing in Siler City, where they feel the pressure of policing in checkpoints. So what did people do in an act of democracy that uses Facebook? They created a Facebook site so that people can communicate about where the checkpoints are. So who's getting over? Who's using democracy in a new form? which is my message to you. All of us are creating a new form of democratic engagement, and that's what it looks like. It's not just, not to say, but it isn't just community activism. We are transforming our democracy, and we have to look at it that way. Look, life is really hard. We're all exhausted. It gets really challenging. So in those moments, I often think of myself like I'm in a movie. You know, sometimes it feels like a Federico Fellini film, like, you know, when the government shuts down, and I think I used that analogy. It was just like, this is completely Kafkaesque. But at other times, 
if you feel like you're in a movie that we're all making history, and it's not about what's happening just in this room, but it is about transforming these deep institutions in our country that for the longest time, because we only believe that our founding fathers are George Washington, and we know, in fact, who our founding fathers and mothers are. They're right here in this state, our native first people. So, if we look at it that way, that it's not just this conversation, but that we are creating structural change, that it is exhausting because we are trying to turn our country around to the place where we all know it has to be. Because this is America. Yeah, some people have preconceived notions, they may be ignorant about certain issues, but mostly people are open. In fact, on my radio show, Latino USA, precisely about that controversial commercial that Coke did, Actually, it wasn't so controversial. People loved it. It was a couple of haters that then people retweet saying, oh, look at all these haters. And it's like, if you didn't retweet them, they'd really be what they are, which is a minority. So we, all of us, are creating democracy. But it's confusing, especially when it comes to immigrants. And frankly, the lack of comprehensive immigration reform so when I was with <clears throat> Koki Roberts, who's a well-known political reporter, and I just said to Koki, I was like, so Koki, what, what do you think about what's happening with the lack of movement on immigration reform? Koki being a pollute, uh, uh, not pollute, uh, astute political reporter said, yeah, the message is real clean, clear. We don't like you enough. We like you, we don't like you, we don't like you enough. We feel this, it isn't, just legislators making decisions and votes, we feel this deeply and it hurts. And so yeah, I get down, I get sad. And so in those moments, I turn to my staff, my team, all of us journalists, and I walk in and I'm like, this is really bad. We're just like not going anywhere. And they're like, Maria, we are not sad Latinos anymore. We may be angry and we may get sad about the truth of what's happening in our community, but we are not pobrecitos. We are not the sad Latinos. When that happens, we double down and we work even harder because we understand that we are carrying the future of this country in our hands. And so, we get more active, which is what this conference is about. It's about encouraging us, making us know that we are not alone in this path to create racial equity and to transform our educational systems. So when we hear these stories, I challenge you to flip the narrative. What does that look like? Okay, so one out of every four kindergartners is now a Latino. Okay, I don't know if any of you saw that Time Magazine cover that they did six months ago, which was like, you know, the class of 2030, and they had three kids, and there was not a Latino face on the cover of Time Magazine talking about the future of education, and not once did they mention Latinos or immigrants. But if you flip the narrative, and we're not talking about the high rates of dropout, but in fact, we base ourselves on studies of Latino students, incoming Latino students. So yeah, maybe they don't come in with great reading skills. La verdad, I came from Mexico. So in my family, in my house in Chicago where I was growing up, we didn't have Hansel and Gretel and Huckleberry Finn and you know, all because mis papas no leyeron eso. So I didn't have it. So maybe I didn't come in with those high reading skills. But what Latino kids have is high capacity social skills. We know how to work together. We know how to work in a collective. We know how to show respeto a los maestros y maestras, respect for our teachers. We know how to work in community. And we're friends. We're actually friends. We're not the mean girls. Okay, sometimes. But mostly, <laughs> at kindergarten age, we're about friendship. Where is that story celebrated? No, we only hear the stories 
of the sad Latinos. So we have to tell our stories. And yeah, some of the, you know, it may mean that you end up making your own Fellini film. What I did is, and what I do is, I do journalism. But I do journalism that I like to believe is completely rooted in the grassroots. So if any of you saw me, I've been taking lots of notes because my, I, my head is just percolating with ideas from people who I have met, things that I've heard, and you can be sure I'm coming back to report about Minneapolis and Minnesota. Promise. But yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna do something pretty amazing. So let me show you what that looks like. What, how sometimes there's a story right in front of you and you don't even realize that it's a story right in front of you that needs to be told. So I was at Latino graduation at DePaul University where I'm a visiting scholar. Um, and there were four young women who went up to get their degrees from environmental science. They had environmental science degrees in June. Four Latinas couldn't have been more different one from the other. One was Puerto Rican, one was a longtime Chicagoan, one was a recent immigrant, and one I don't remember. But they were totally different. But they all had environmental science degrees. Now all of you know about STEM, right? Science, te technology, engineering, math. This is like the story, right, of what's gonna save us. So I looked at these young women. They were all buddy-buddy, of course, because they were the only four Latinas studying environmental science classes together. And I said, oh great, I've just created a new segment. We're gonna call it the STEM Sisters. <laughs> and they come on our air, they have a national platform, and we talk about what it is to be a Latina graduate with a STEM degree. Are they finding jobs? Is it that easy? Do they have mentors? Do they have a path? So I'm gonna tell you one story of why it's important for us, for all of us, to also open up our eyes within stories that are closest to us. One of those environmental science graduates came home one day and her dad is a window washer in Chicago, Mexican immigrant window washer. She came home and she was like, yeah, dad, I'm gonna go do my homework now. I've, um, I'm gonna go collect soil samples. And the dad was like, yo quiero ir, I wanna go with you. And the daughter was like, dad, <clears throat> I'm collecting soil samples, like why? And then the dad said, Mijita, what you don't know is that I was an agronomist in Mexico with a master's degree. And that moment, father and daughter relationship completely transformed. We told that story on the air. So sometimes those stories are right in front of you. And yet what we know is that we don't see ourselves in the media, we don't hear our stories. We don't, see our vo we don't hear our voices, we don't see our faces. We are massive consumers of media and journalism, just the way I was as a kid growing up. But I was like, pero donde estoy yo? I'm invisible. Our challenge now is to make the invisible visible. And that's why we love this conference so much, because you own it. You don't, all, you don't only wanna make it visible, you want to change the dynamic of the conversation so that racial equity becomes something real. Changing the narrative looks like this too, where if you're a dreamer, it's a difficult situation. But when I met a dreamer at IIT, Illinois Institute of Technology, where I was doing a story because for the first time I met somebody who gave me a business card and the business card said, undocumented student liaison at IIT, and I said, oh no, I'm doing a story about you. You actually have undocumented liaison on your business card? What? Okay, so one of her students was this young man, he was a dreamer, really geeky with the pencils in his white shirt, you know, and all that, and he said that he had known that he was undocumented from the time that he was very young, and I said, well, how did that happen? He said, well, my family talked about it, but the way I understood it was that my teachers talked to me about it, and they said, mira, Luis, you're gonna go to school, but you have to learn to love to be educated just for the sake of learning, period. You just have to love to learn, because the other kids, they're gonna be thinking about graduating and getting a job, but that may not happen for you, so it's literally about learning, and that's what he said. He said, I love to learn just for learning's sake. Can we imagine transforming the conversation around dreamers so that we're saying 
We are students who love to learn for learning's sake. Can we do that? The parents, unfortunately, as you know, also feel disempowered. They are afraid. They are afraid to go into schools. They are afraid to question. They're afraid. And I've got a son who just applied to colleges. And honestly, if I didn't speak English or if I was undocumented trying to get my son through that process, I can't imagine. And yet, people are doing that. They're not disempowered. And in fact, again, flipping the narrative, as we know right here in Minneapolis, undocumented folks are running for school board election because they can. It is constantly back and forth. In the New York Times, there was a piece just two days ago about assembly line justice. Again, what is it in our country where you can be before a judge and be charged and convicted and sentenced within a matter of seconds? Due process violated for one means due process can be violated for all of us. How we can find a way within our communities to own our own narratives, you're creating those stories. I'm gonna give you an example. So Idaho, not too far from here. Um, one town, and how did I know this story? Because I was interviewing the president of the Idaho Dairy Farmers Association on Latino USA. Hmm? Okay, this is what happened. In one town in Idaho, immigration went and sat in front of the one supermarket and the only people that immigration was encountering were people who were brown skinned. And we were summarily getting them and putting them into, into deportation proceedings immediately. And one of the dairy farmers went to one of his workers who was undocumented and who had been there for 20 years, so he was like part of the family. And he asked him, what does it feel like for you to, to know that this is happening at the supermarket? And he said, well, he said, my family, we don't go out at the same time anymore. My wife and my, myself, we never go out with the kids at the same time because if both of us are deported, then what would happen with our kids? And the Idaho dairy farmer said, that's not what Idaho is about. We're about families going out to the movies together, going to church together, going to the park together, and now we've got families that won't go out together in Idaho. That's not how we do things in Idaho. And he got involved in challenging that immigration presence in his country, in his, in his town. And also because the Idaho Dairy Farmers Association had people within their community who had roots in Dutch areas of Europe during World War II, they knew, they knew what racial profiling looked and felt like. So Dutch immigrants understanding racial profiling from Europe and bringing that into their experience in Idaho and saying, not here, not with our people. So do you see how even establishing the dialogue amongst yourselves, you can uncover these stories of amazing promise and resistance within our own country. We were having a meeting um, just before <clears throat> I came up here, came down here, and one of the things that came up that I've heard a few times is our self-doubt. You know that, that US Mambo? Yeah, it creates a tremendous amount of self-doubt. And so we're not sure of ourselves most of the time, which is why the Columbia University group, Latino group that asked me to speak um, during Latino History Month, they, they had a title, which is, I quote it now because it's my favorite title for a, a, con for a conference. It was called, Dejando la duda atrás, acknowledging the power of our voices, leaving the doubts aside and acknowledging the power of our voices. Mis queridos, that doubt that we have, it is with us, but we have to learn how to quash it. And I'm always finding very clear strategies for how to do that. My husband, who is from the Dominican Republic where the United States invaded, in 1965 and so lived through a war, he told me, he told me he learned how to eat his fear. So I've learned how to eat my fear. Mm? And I swallow it. Rita Moreno, the amazing Rita Moreno, who I had the joy of interviewing just a couple of weeks ago, and she said, 
oh yeah, yeah, when I get that call that I'm gonna get that Lifetime Achievement Award, she's like, I just become that five-year-old girl from Puerto Rico on the boat. And she says, and, and that voice inside my head fills me with self-doubt and says, no, Rita, you're just an imposter. You don't really deserve this. You're not really good enough. You have, you know, it's filled with self-doubt. And what does Rita Morena do? She takes that voice, which she has named and made a character, and she punishes that voice and tells her that she is locked in her room, closes the door, and throws away the key. And she says, te callas, te callas, you shut up she says to her little voice. That voice of self-doubt that has the potential of holding back our kids, we have to tell them and teach them how to eat their fear and put their self-doubt into punishment, into a timeout. Why is it important for us to see ourselves represented, for us to tell our own stories, for us to own the power of our narratives? Because if we continue to be defined by others, then they will see us as the other. And right now in our United States, we are facing a time when the other, unfortunately, is dehumanized, right? So how many of you have used the term illegal, illegal immigrant, los ilegales, soy ilegal? There is no such thing as an illegal human being, mis queridos. And if you don't trust me on this, and you now can quote, don't quote me, quote Elie Wiesel. Elie Wiesel, who survived the Holocaust. He was the one, it wasn't a radical Latino, you know, Chicano professor in college, no. It was Elie Wiesel who told me to never use the term illegal immigrant. He said, you know what they did? The Nazis declared the Jews an illegal people. That's how the Holocaust started. There is no such thing as an illegal human being. You may have committed a crime, but for any of us who have ever been stopped for a traffic violation, you're no longer, then you're not always then an illegal driver. Or if you got audited, you're not an illegal taxpayer. Or if you didn't pay your alimony, you're not an illegal father. We are not illegal. We are a people. And to try to dehumanize us, to create the other, so then we can keep these people, our brothers and sisters, in conditions that are inhuman? No. So I urge you. There's another word. Okay, I know. It's part of, I'm sorry, but I also don't use the word minority. I don't see myself as a minority. I don't see my kids as minorities. I don't see my husband. I don't see what I'm doing as coming from a minority perspective. In fact, the bigger question is to white America, what do you think about becoming a minority? Minority in our country has always been disenfranchised, disempowered, voiceless. Do we want the numerical minority that's going to be the future in our country, white America, to feel that way? Do we want them? Do we want to look at them that way? We, all of us as educators, change what the definition of minority is. We change the definition so that it doesn't mean disempowered, disengaged, and disenfranchised. Do you see how in every action we can become disruptors? Or as you said, where's David? The politics of interruption. We are disruptors. We are changing the narrative. We are challenged. We feel alone so much of the time. And so much of the time, because of this, I'm seen as somebody who is, I don't know, unpatriotic. Or because I want to tell the stories of the voiceless, I'm seen as anti-American. Or because I identify as being a Mexican immigrant, I am somehow less from the USA. No, now what I do, because I urge you to do this, it's like you have to just, you have to just take ownership of this thing. I was thinking about this, how terrible I feel when people think that because of the work that I'm doing, I'm un-American. I became an American citizen by choice, and so I take this very, very seriously. And I said, no, I'm not gonna let that happen. And so now, I call myself an American journalist in the tradition of Edward R. Murrow and Frederick Douglass. That's who I am. That is my legacy. We change the definition, and all of you in the work that you do with your students and in your institutions, 
all have the capacity to move beyond our comfort zone and to begin to think about taking the power that we have to change the narrative, to flip the conversation, to give it a different story, and to make the invisible visible. And I'm gonna end with just one quick story because I tell it basically at every speech I learned. I didn't tell it at Excelencia because I had eight minutes. Um, I'll make it really short. So September 11th, New York City, I'm working for CNN. I'm committed to telling stories of the invisible, of the unseen, and so within a day and a half, I was already doing the stories of undocumented immigrants who were victims, and at that point, patriots, um, after 9-11. So we end up doing a story about Julia Hernandez, who had lost her husband, Antonio Melendez, um, and he had left four kids, and we put this story on, on, on CNN, and, and it gets beautiful response from people, because at that point, you know, you're able to see yourself in the eyes of the person most unlike you. So, December of 2001, the phone rings, and I answer the phone, Inojosa, CNN, because that's the way I answered, and on the other side of the line, it was like, hi, Miss Heine Josa. Listen, my name is A.J. Dinkins, and I'm originally from South Carolina, but I now live in Augusta, Maine, and Miss Heine Josa, I want to come and meet the Julia Hernandez family because myself and my partner, Rudy the Farmer, I'm a style, hairstylist myself, uh, we want to bring uh, several thousand dollars that our church raised for this family. But I have never been to New York City, Miss Maria, and I have never been to the Bronx. Would you come and get me at the airport and take me to see Miss Julia Hernandez? And I said, AJ, my name is Ina Hosa, and no, I will not be at the airport to pick you up. I actually will be at the airport with a camera crew because I'm gonna do this story about the day that the gay hairdresser from Maine came to give gifts to the undocumented Mexican immigrant family in the Bronx. So we picked up AJ at the airport. You know, it was Christmas time. He had dyed his hair red. And we took him to the Bronx. And, you know, there were no Mexicans in Maine in 2001. They're there now. But in 2001, so AJ had never met any Mexicans. And Julia had never met a white gay man that she didn't work for. So um, <laughs> anyway, they got along fabulously. It was a total love fest you know, communicating with or without language, it didn't matter. And AJ left and he was like, oh my gosh, I just love this family. I'm gonna invite them to come and spend a weekend up at my farm in Maine. Who knew? <laughs> Six months later, the phone rings. Hey Maria, listen, I need you to pack up your husband and your kids because I have just invited Julia Hernandez, her four kids, plus a cousin, to come and spend a week in my farm in Maine. Will you come? I said, AJ, I'm not bringing my husband or my kids, but I'll be there with a the camera crew to do this story about the day that the gay hairdresser and his farmer partner invited the family of undocumented immigrants to his home. Bueno. Augusta, Maine, 2002 was a very homogeneous place. I haven't been up there, so I think it's changed a little bit, but 2002, it was not diverse. So people are looking at us like, who are these people, right? I mean, it was me, my hippie cameraman, my African-American sound tech, um, AJ with blonde hair, uh, Rudy the farmer, six foot four, Julia, the four kids plus a cousin. And people were looking at us like, who are these people and what are they doing here? Why are they here, this motley crew? And then they'd be like, but they all look so happy. Because all we were there to do was to show our love for those kids who were about to celebrate, commemorate, the one year anniversary of their father's death. And everyone in Augusta, Maine, made this family, this family feel loved and made feel like they were American heroes. And when I asked AJ about why he did this, he said, it's not about me. Yeah, I got out of my comfort zone. It was Julia who accepted. Julia who said, I'm gonna get out of my comfort zone. I'm taking my kids to a gay couple's house and we're gonna live together on a farm for a week. And everybody in that moment was moved by love. And ultimately, mis queridos, it is about that. It is about being able to see yourself in the person most unlike you. Being able to see yourself in the person most unlike you. And that definition of multiculturalism came from the great American writer, Sandra Cisneros, whose books have been banned in Arizona learn how to see ourselves in the person most unlike us. That is the true American spirit. And for all of the work that you do in breaking and changing and correcting the narrative of who America is, I honor you 
and I am so thankful that you asked me to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you.